Hey, my name is Tony Hamilton. I'm a solution architect, um, a career experienced uh, IT professional. And I'm delighted today to be with uh, music therapist Hope Young, producer Stephen Bartlett, and the delightful uh, Cassie Shankman, who's a fantastic composer and hopefully one day a Grammy Award winner. So, um, so as you may or may not know, um, a, our panel movement tracks for biotech and technology merge is part of a renaissance, a conversation around to help and support the, uh, the spirit and uh, the physical well-being of humanity, especially around challenging health issues such as cerebral palsy and Parkinson's disease. Um, that's why I'm here today. I believe in helping others. A, with my heart and soul, and this is what we're going to discuss, a methodology, an approach, and, and also show some instinctive insights and in how this methodology works and changes lives. So with that said, over to you, Hope. Well, thank you, Tony, and you guys, thank you so much for spending your afternoon with us, and we're delighted to have you. So one of the great needs I have had since childhood is to help. And especially, um, my story starts young. Uh, the demand, why this is so important to me, is the need, the demand. When I was little, uh, my mom uh, got her undergraduate as a color tourist, soprano, composer, incredible musician. She did her master's and PhD work in special ed. Hearing impaired, I have a congenital loss just like my mom. <laughs> We're both musicians, just like Beethoven. And um, mom was the head of special ed for Michigan. Uh, as a little girl, I used to play with all the kids who didn't have arms or legs or were hearing impaired. It was very natural with mom and I always doing music and seeing the difference, but it got more personal as my mom's depression turned to bipolar disorder. And the music is powerful, but it's not enough. And I can speak from that personally because even though when mom would have her worst moments, there was a way to still connect to her through the music it wasn't transforming our lives the way a treatment level would with very predictive and more precise tools. So when later years came around and lithium carbonate got more developed and more precise in the dosing and just those chemical research to make a treatment that actually would really bring mom stable and well back as my mom, I really appreciate the value of science and methodology and keep pushing towards when humanity has a need and it's personal for me, how we have, with the sciences and with the arts, merged how we have predictive, more precise, and more personalized medicine. And that's been my last 30 years as a professional, and especially the last 15 for the Movement Tracks Project, since I've been a clinician that long, to get music as a music therapist to that level of medical application. Precise, predictable, analytics, and personalized. So, Right now, I would like to do a little bit of an experiential to help you guys get a little bit of idea what we've done and where we're at right now and where we hope to go. Um, actually, before I do that, let's show you a video so you can see where the story is, and then I'll get you into a little bit more of the experience. So let's watch this video. My name is Hope Young, and I own the Center for Music Therapy in Austin, Texas. And we are here at the CSM, American Physical Therapy Association National Conference. In its exciting moment, we have the launch of Biodex Medical Systems Gate Trainer 3 system with an integrated music therapy option to increase neuroplasticity training in the rehab setting. So it's the first time that music is being intentionally integrated with a biomedical system for treatment of gait disorders such as Parkinson's, stroke, head injury, multiple sclerosis. So it's a very exciting moment. Our Movement Tracks project team developed these recordings in 2015 and they're making their debut out in the market. Instead of on Pandora or through Apple, we are right here through Biodex Medical Systems and these are the only systems that they're licensed to and allowed to be played for patients to regain walking. I'm Jamie Reese, I'm president of Biodex Medical Systems. We're showing our new gait trainer with music therapy 
added to it. The product is the hit of this meeting. We have 11,000 people here. They intuitively understand the connection between physical activity and cognitive activity. I can't say enough about how excited I am about the potential of this product and everything that will follow after it. It's the first time anyone has connected those two elements. And again, everyone understands exactly what we're trying to do and really appreciates it. So that's just a, an intro of where we are right now. Um, I'm going to back up and talk about the need a little bit more with some statistics. So you heard about Parkinson's, um, and you heard about music therapy. How many of you have ever even heard of music therapy before? Hey! All right. <laughs> now that's good. So actually, as a panel, we would have put our hands up as well. That's right. <laughs> just, that's right. Just didn't want to do that right now. So t today's population in the United States, when you're talking about the need and uh, what we're doing with tech, we have a current population of 318 million people. We have current um, 6,300 music therapists in the United States. Just over half of those practicing full time. So you can see from a business owner and scale perspective, we have a problem. That's an insufficient service delivery model to meet the demand. We have a looming crisis coming up, and it's now, but it's going to really hit us these next 50 years. In the United States and globally, in all the developing world, we have an aging population without the millennials and everybody making babies enough to keep up to provide caregivers for all these statistics. Listen to this. 65 and older in the United States, if you're that age, there are 40.2 million from the 2010 census with the projection of 88.5 million people over the age of 65 by 2050. For the demographic, if you're 85 and over, there's 6.3 million in the uh, statistics for 2015. That's going to almost triple by 2015 to 17.9 million people. That's 4.5% of the total U.S. population. This is happening all over the globe, and that's why you hear a lot of the aging in place modeling that Intel, and we're in discussion with Intel. Ours is integrating with that kind of system and design. So when you talk about just two diagnoses, we're talking Parkinson's is typically age 50 and older, but what about the kids? We have cerebral palsy. And that's 79,000 kids with cerebral palsy. And in the movement track, since that's all part of the movement disorders family, MS, stroke, head injury, what we focused on as a movement is to capture as many people as we can help with music, with the integrated technologies, and health. So just to give you a little bit of the statistical background, why this is so important, that hopefully puts a little context of now, but why we need to be moving that needle hard in a collaborative way in partnership with technology companies um, now and in the future. So, Hal, thank you for your personal testimony and, and thank you for your service in this particular area of a, what I consider leading edge sort of medical care approaches. Um, you're clearly passionate about, about this. You've spent <laughs> your whole life in, the, in this area. Um, but quick question, who else is involved? Um, I mean, I'm fully aware of what's going on over the last 10 or 15 years, but who else is involved? Who are all the stakeholders in such a, a, a wide, sounds like a wide initiative. Yeah, and you'll see as the, the videos go on that we do. These, this is a cross-sector project. So you have the music sector, which you're going to hear. We had to start there because the way music is designed, um, the whole engineering of it, wasn't moving fast enough. I've known, actually my friend Mike is here. Um, we've talked for the last 15 years trying to figure out, to get it to the point where the music and the technology could integrate. And the real problem was on the music side. So on the music sector, we have engineers. We have all my Grammy friends, you know, Ray Benson, Malcolm Harper. If you guys know Rupert Neve, he's one of the gods of analog sound. He and I have been having conversations for 20 some years, since the 90s, about this. Um, Merging technologies, who you can hear a lot about, and other technology companies in music are working hard to innovate to make the music be able to work with the technology. In the technology side, we have so many partners, Biodex Medical Systems, um, we're in discussions with Intel, we're in discussions with Hitachi on the innovation side, the city of Austin to bring this design in as a mobility, active mobility, for transportation solutions around town. 
that's called inclusive. So we're in discussions with Ted Lear, who's had data for the city. We're also working with the medical. So how many of you know about the whole IT transformation in medical to electronic medical records, to telebased um, healthcare service delivery, so your doctors, your therapists can Skype into you, can read your analytics, your information, your chart, and delivering the care more where you are at versus you coming to the brick and mortar facility for care. So we're in partnerships talking with Medicare and moving things to value-based care on the macros design, if you know, on the reimbursement financial side. So you can see we also have partners at the universities, UT, University of St. Augustine, who you can hear about. Complex but beautiful collaboration and everybody working towards creating that future together. Great. So, so I was just taking some notes there. So, it, well, it's a, it's almost like a multinational sort of ecosystem. Moment, ecosystem, right? <laughs> so, it's business, society, state and local government, healthcare, music, and academia. And I'm sure I've missed someone. And if, if I have missed you, and you're in the room. Please don't, please don't leave right at this point in time. Um, another question, Hope: Is this global? Are there other countries involved? Are there other similar hope, hopes? In other, in other yes. nations and other in other cities. And Tony, you've helped that. You've helped that. You introduced me um, to Hitachi, to Steve, and then he introduced us to the group in Copenhagen. Great. And they're working hard. I'll be in Europe next month, in Italy, in France. Um, I'm hoping to get to Copenhagen, but I've got Poland, Germany, France, the UK, all to make in like just 37 days. But Singapore, I know you're going to show a model of Singapore. Um, China has reached out to us, the head of Gibson. Uh, music is very interested in, in furthering music in this market in Asia. Um, so yes, it's a global movement, and music is everywhere. And so it, it's a really nice fit. And the health demand is everywhere. Great. Interesting. Interesting. So I believe we're going to show one mm -hmm. more ready? video before we talk to the delightful Cassie. So bear with us. So. I don't always have access to a music therapist. It depends on whether there is one that works at the facility that I do and if there's one available. And so with this new methodology, it creates a system that allows a physical therapist to still utilize music interventions for our clients. And the music now is starting to incorporate the neuroplasticity and the changes that we see in the brain. For example, a person with Parkinson's disease, the issue is their brain doesn't tell them to move like it should and they no longer receive that internal cue and if I can utilize music to give them that external cue to take a step to move their leg forward to start walking that's a huge advantage for my therapy session and ultimately the patient. Neuroplasticity is an amazing concept that didn't always exist. There was a time we thought that when a, the brain had an injury or a child that was born with a congenital condition, that was status quo. We weren't going to see a lot of improvements upon that. And luckily, we've learned that that's not true. We've learned that through rehab and through challenging a person, we can create changes within the brain. We've known this in our orthopedic athletic world for years. If you want to run further or run a marathon, you can make changes within your body and your system to perform better. And that's really what we want to capture with our neurological population as well. With the future studies that we have planned, we're really focusing on those individuals that have Parkinson's disease and children with cerebral palsy, but it's wide open to whom this could help with. It's certainly not limited to those two diagnoses. Um, I love these videos. I, th I think they're a testimony to how much caring there is actually um, by these individuals uh, on the panel. But Cassie, over to you, um, future Grammy winner. <laughs> Hopefully you'll give me your autograph when that happens. Um, you've gone from knowing little or nothing about music therapy to a full-blown supporter. In fact, I want to say you're an innovator. You've actually contributed ideas, and your ideas are actually being applied right now in, in showing tangible results, which we're gonna display in a, a few moments. What compelled you to be involved in this, this area? So. Yeah, so um, basically I have always been interested in 
music and medicine. And in high school, actually, it was, I was either going to study music or I was going to study medicine. That was, that was all I wanted to do. Um, and about seven years ago, I um, met Hope at the Center for Music Therapy. I volunteered there, and um, I had a lot of fun. It was a really great experience. And then we ended up rekindling, actually, at a, at a Grammy event. <laughs> um, about uh, about two years ago uh, when this whole project started and Hope presented this idea to me and I, I just fell in love with it. Um, I was like, yeah, I'm so on board. It's gonna be challenging, but I'm so on board because it's completely different from the music that I write. I write, I, I write film music, I write pop music, I arrange, I orchestrate, I do all that stuff and it's very, um, it's very different. You, you can't just go in writing that. Um, you have to write music that correlates to each gate issue. Gate issues are bodily, are body movement issues, or body functions. And so um, each element, each instrumentation correlates to that. And that's something that Hope and I, we did, and all the therapists, Emily Morris, who's also here, um, we did a lot of, we, we did a lot of research. It was incredible, it was a lot of fun. Um, it was a lot of work to, it was very challenging to just to, to sit down and figure out how we're going to do this. Um, and that was something that, that I really liked. I enjoyed that, so, um, so yeah. Great, thank you for those, those key points. And I think for me, what I, what, I, what I would take from your comments is that, that it is personalized, it is personalized to the health challenge of an individual. It's not just one size fits all, yeah, so, it's, so to speak. Yeah, it's so. definitely like, it's not like music isn't necessarily selfish, but it kind of is. You're writing it for you know to make money, or writing it to um, you know for a movie or whatever to make yourself feel better, and that's totally fine. But this is also something. Like, there's nothing wrong with that. That's also, I mean, part of this project too. And but we're like making people walk again. We're making we're in, making people like have better lives. You know, you can actually see it happen, and that's that's awesome. That just makes you feel awesome every day you know um, so that's fantastic so as a technologist um, you know I, I there's those trendy phrases or topical subjects we talk about almost every day something comes up every year I've heard a lot about tech therapy virtual health uh, is, is does movement tracks have a place in these in these sort of trends and the evolution of these these sort of uh, industry segment applications. Yeah, um, for sure. I'd there's, love your thoughts. So. There's, um, I mean, music therapy, uh, music just in general, you know, we basically when you're in a session, um, we're trying to do create this project specifically to take people outside of the facility, to take them outside of a, a therapy session, to, to really create this environment where they're feeling strong, they're feeling um, happy and they're not like okay I'm going to a therapy session they're um, and so with this that's why that's why we're creating live sounds that's why we're creating this music at, and recording at a, at a very different level than anything else and so it, with stuff like virtual reality with all this technology that's pushing forward that's just another element that we can do um, where we can really you know push outside of the boundaries and create this environment that all of these, that all of the patients can really just enjoy, um, and enjoy going to therapy, enjoy and really build all these different um, uh, memories, you know, associated, not necessarily associated with therapy, but just, you know, in a way where they, they're just more positive about, about that approach. And um, it's integrated yeah. to where they live. Yeah. Instead of being in a treatment it's integrated what they are to their need, yeah. where they live, wherever that is. So great, again, great, great comments. And so now we've, we've, we've talked about a sort of a vision, a methodology. Let, let's talk about a particular number of patients or e examples. Um, is everyone familiar with Gabby Gifford? Who knows what's happened to Gabby Gifford? We won't go into the details, but I believe the movement tracks help Gabby, is that correct? Yeah, actually, um, well, we didn't personally, but, but okay. yeah, but Mia, Mia, yeah, Mia um, if you saw Mia, the music therapist, she, she trained at the Center for Music Therapy. She was my intern, and we trained her in her rehab, and she's Gabby's music therapist that worked her through that journey. Yeah, and it's, it's incredible. So she, if you don't know about her, she um, got, she had a bullet 
uh, sh shot into her head and basically has recovered almost 100% through that, um, through music therapy. And uh, basically her right side of the brain, uh, her, the speech part of her brain was completely impaired um, through the wound. And because of that, um, with music therapy, we, she was able to regain speech by creating pathways on with music. So with music and song, she was able to um, speak the words and music, like she sung Brown Eyed Girl was one of her favorite songs, mm -hmm. um, and was able to, to start speaking again. And that's incredible. So instead of, if you're thinking of driving on a, on a highway and you're going down and there's a traffic jam, you're gonna take a different route. You're gonna go, you know, the freeway. That's exactly what music does. It, there, music's all over your brain, so basically you can create different paths to learn how to speak again, um, learn how to walk again, learn how to do all this different types of stuff again. That's that. the neuroplasticity yeah. that you, you hear us keep speaking about. And music, as we're saying, it really is a fundamental structure because it's a neurologic phenomena. Nothing else except music can activate all areas of the brain at the same time. So those intact areas that weren't damaged through the gunshot wound could reach, could grow, and make connections over the areas that were damaged and lost. And if you know Dr. Um, Oliver Sacks, um, he has a quote that I, that's just very r true. Nothing activates the brain so extensively as music, and that's very true. That's, that's what we're trying to do here. Um, as it is with VR, you know, you can create this environment where somebody's just totally unaware that they're walking um, because they're walking in a field and they're visually seeing that. I don't know if you guys have tried any VR stuff, but I, I did one where I had headphones on, I was, you know, and goggles, everything, and there was a spider that was crawling up my arm. And it was, I was just looking at it, you know, in the goggles, but I was actually, I felt it. And I have, I was, it wasn't there, but I was feeling it. And that's crazy. That's, that's the, what this is doing. It's going to be, it's bringing and building pathways. You know, so there's there's so much that this project can go forward. So, so thanks, Cassie. Thanks. And I'm just going to comment on the virtuality. Some of the teams that we're in discussion with, we're talking about it more as a merged reality. So, if you've heard of that level of VR, that's actually where we want to go. More with the merged. That means you're walking through this room while there's some VR on the peripheral vision, but you're actually integrating. You're seeing the chairs. You're seeing where you are that you have some virtual uh, things coming in to the peripheral with the auditory mix and with, I can show you an example of tactile. We use, in the video, you see that wearable that he's running with. We have a tactile stem that goes with that, a tactile body cue simultaneous. So, so thanks, Hope. And I believe we've got one more video, uh, a personal example, a young lady who lives in Austin. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's amazing the transformation that's happened in this young girl's life. So. Go ahead, Holt. This is Lila. This is Lila. Yes. And we're very grateful for Lila. She's been an important part. My name is Jennifer Trogott. My daughter's name is Lila Trogott. She has cerebral palsy, and we've been taking part in the Movement Tracks research project for eight weeks. Lila was born, and she was full term, no problems expected, but problems developed very quickly. They told me they didn't think she would ever sit up. They said she probably would never be able to feed herself, and so it would best benefit her to get her home so that you guys could be comfortable. Lila started music therapy when she was about four years old. She's seven now. I was really intrigued that first time that we sat down with the live musicians and walking around with her and truly seeing the difference in her gait immediately. It was fascinating. I know that each adjustment that's been made to the music has made a difference. It's a very intriguing thing how the brain works and, and how it's reacting to the music. She's excelling so far beyond what people thought she could do. It's amazing to watch her be able to interact with the other children really well and this music seems to kind of talk to her body in a way that physically showing her things cannot. Where we're going in the future is with very advanced analytics with wearable type technologies to where our little girl Lila that you've been seeing following her story she'll be walking to school from a bus stop that has a mile walk and she will be using a wearable that has our algorithm blended with a platform that is measuring what's going on with her walking and something a car might drive by and splash a big puddle of water on her and it may cause spasticity. Well, instead of waiting her to come to the treatment room to fix that, right where we're at, we can pull up 
the data and analytics from her wearable. Send a corrective sensory input through the music that will get her back in her normal gait. So that's our vision, is to take this technology really to a whole new level in the future where the treatment room becomes where patients are living, what their needs are, sensory optimization strategies that we're developing as part of the Movement Tracks project. Why high quality sound is so important is because human beings respond extremely differently to a narrow bandwidth like everybody hears now through your headphones and your MP3. You're only hearing an extremely narrow, tight range of the overall human experience of sound. When you experience live, which everybody loves, everybody loves the live events. Why do you think you love that? You're digging the full bandwidth of live sound and live experience. You respond completely differently from your head to your toes, to your nerves, to your neurons. That's the way we're meant to experience music. But to make it scalable, we made a commodity that we can put in a phone and it can go over the world. So in our recordings we did, we partnered with Merging Technologies and we also consulted with Rupert Neve. If you know sound, you know Rupert is one of our gods in full analog sound. Our recordings were all done in DSD, that it captures full analog bandwidth as live as you can get in a digital format that can be then put and scaled into mobile technologies. So our model, our design captures everything, full DSD, full analog, and we have a great partner and are very grateful to Merging Technologies for enabling that. Uh, so Stephen, you've been patient, you've been silent. Uh, we, we appreciate it, we love you. We, what we're seeing, or what I believe we're seeing is tech meets therapy, therapy meets tech. You've been on this journey a long time, also almost a decade or, or longer. You know, is this, as a producer, uh, which has predominantly been your career, is this a career change? Is it a technology change? What, what's really going on here, um, in, in yeah. your opinion? So. Um, I guess, for me, right, the reason I started doing music was because I think everyone in this room uses music therapy in some way. Whether it's putting a song on to go to sleep or whether you're putting a song on before you go out on a Friday night or something. We all get affected and transformed by music in a certain way that nothing else seems to do. And uh, I, several years ago, I got approached by a music therapist who, who was working with kids with severe brain injuries. And they asked me to come on board and I started doing recordings, which were possibly the first recordings ever for music therapy. And we started doing them and, and seeing the results was just incredible. So from that small initiation, about six or seven years ago, I, I continued researching and, and understanding what direct steam digital is and different forms and, and why the brain reacts to music in a way that it doesn't react to anything. And uh, a couple of years ago, I met Hope at a, here in Austin at South by Southwest, actually. And um, yeah, it was just, it was the obvious next step and something that I had, like, I wanted to add to my career as well. Fantastic. And you've trademarked that phrase, right? Music therapy is for everyone, right? Uh, something like that, Is yeah. that right? Is that, is yeah, that your, okay, great, good, good for you. So, but bringing it together, um, the challenges, um, there's so many moving parts in my opinion. And, and you know, trust me, I get complexity as an engineer or software expert, but this feels like another level of complexity because you're actually bringing the sort of human spirit and, and, and health issues into the into the conversation or, or the research. How how long does it take? What are well, the challenges that you've dealt it's, with? Um, there? And it, keep it clean, right? Remember we're yeah. video recorded. So. It's uh, how long is a piece of string? You know, we okay. with every challenge that we have, we have some failures, and we have to keep going back and looking at the science. Uh, what I said earlier is we all use music, but we still are learning how that works. So whenever you're trying to discover a new science or learn something from like the molecular level up. You have to test theories, and so we're doing things, we're testing them and going again. Um, from a very practical level, it means like incredibly high quality recordings, and it means the rooms and the musicians and every single part requires an incredible amount of focus to get it just right, through to then testing the results of that, getting scientific data back, and then altering. Uh, we've, I've kind of developed a way to uh, create music that can be changed by any user who doesn't understand the music in real time and that eventually that will respond to the body's needs, um, not just an occupational therapist's input, but that's, that's a very challenging thing to create something that can be undone and still work as well as when it's fully completed.
So there is some secret sauce to it, but we're there not, is we're not divulging sauce. it. That's yeah. where I get yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. That's right. why they pay me the big bucks. We do have <laughs> patents, just so you know. They're, they're okay. on file. We just filed two weeks ago in Europe, so. Okay, <laughs> super. Yeah. Super. Well, thank, thank you for those, those comments. And, um, God, and, you know, and w one of the things that Hope and I have discussed over almost a year now is this idea of this renaissance in, in healthcare it has many moving parts and many components, but the one goal ultimately I believe Hope, Cassie and Stephen have is that there's a freedom associated with movement tracks over time. And for that freedom to take place, it will have to be in context with what, is, what we're all involved in right now is um, what's called being called smart cities and societies. Um, this is an area that I've been looking at for 30 years, started in Scotland, uh, looking at digital techniques to help communities. Um, it's become a hot topic, even at South by Southwest. Um, what's interesting is the term smart cities isn't a new term. It was first used in 1869 at the St. Louis World Fair. Um, I wasn't there personally, <laughs> but, but what's happening now is that platforms are being created, a, a digital platforms that stream all kinds of information. And to Hope's point, that information can be analyzed for better insights. And you can imagine in five years time or even less, um, the young lady on the video like Lila, having this real time analytical application behind her gait issues or, or some of her health issues that give us some suggested responses or proposed responses for um, her caretakers or her, or her parents. Now that's a bold statement by me, right? Um, I've already signed a disclaimer on that, so don't run to the press with that. But what you are gonna see is concepts like movement tracks be associated and blended with, um, and the precision of something like uh, movement tracks be associated with smart cities and smart societies. Um, leading countries in, involved in this are like Singapore, Denmark is, is a leading country that's looking at how you unify all these uh, information flows. And we're also hoping that the United States is a leader and mm -hmm. even Austin, Austin mm -hmm. Texas. So. I just, uh, one of the things in that slide, you see the lady on the ground with the walker and somebody sending a signal that she's down. Well, what we're working actually is by predictive analytics, knowing and tracking when people are at risk of falling before they take that fall, and being able to send sensory strategies to correct when they're starting to have an issue. And like I said, if, if Lila was walking the ACC campus in the Riverside Corridor, uh, there's a mile walk from that bus stop to the campus she has to traverse. And she's still gonna have cerebral palsy even when she's 18 and goes off to college. But if she's got her music and she has an event like anybody like myself who's had a big pile of water splashed on you, it makes everybody do this. Now, if you have cerebral palsy, that's hard to get out of. She immediately has a response, a sensory strategy that can help throw her back into normalized gait or a 211 or 311 call if we're watching that it's not correcting fast enough so she doesn't end up on the ground. Right? You don't want somebody just stranded a half mile from their walk. And that's what people with MS, people with cerebral palsy, Parkinson's, they want to, the freedom to get up and walk around, but they're scared right now because of that risk of that fall. So we're bringing those sensory strategies into the technologies in these type of ecosystems. So the center's involved in Austin City's Up Consortium. We're involved with HIMS, the Health Informations Group. We're involved in so many of these designing to prevent that, right? Where you're at, change the sensory environment, knowing that you're at risk of a fall and engage me before that happens. Or, or calling 211 or a 311 or a 911 response if, if something's really going on that won't take you to a hospital but take you home. <laughs> so, so, so great comments, yeah, yeah. Hope. Um, so, so hopefully this, this sort of kind of, so it ends the formal part of our, of our panel and discussion. I have I one thing I'd, I'd like to try. Yep. Hold on. Go ahead. I okay. feel we've just provided a small 
inside, you know, it's like, you know, looking through a, a window or a portal about what the depth of experience and knowledge and passion about this subject um, a, that hope Cassie and, uh, and Stephen have, but hopefully it's inspired some of you to ask some questions or think differently about the future of healthcare and a, a physical ailments for uh, that are, exist in society. Now, Hope's going to try an experiment here, so this I is am. the fun part. I am. Before I, before I start that, because I think once we do this experience with you guys, you're going to get it in a more real level. We're going to actually play one of our recordings at 45 beats per minute, which is 45 okay. steps per minute, which most of us do not walk around the world like that, but there are millions who do. And the future where we're going, these recordings were at 45, and there's no other recordings like it in the world that are meant for movement at that tempo range. Cassie has already begun with me, and Emily recordings for four beats per minute because there are millions of people on the planet. That is the range and the tempo that they begin walking. The babies with cerebral palsy don't start at 45. They start at four beats per minute. So I'm going to play a recording. And Paul, you volunteered. Sure. All right, come on up front. And any of you who want to stand up in an aisle or just you know have your feet going, try to feel what it's like to have a metronome, which is um, what most of the PTs and folks who've had a stroke or have our little kids learning to walk that have cerebral palsy, which makes it a very slow movement, what they have right now to work with. But metronomes do not go below 40 beats per minute. Western music doesn't exist below 40 beats per minute. But guess what we're doing? We're creating recordings of music for everybody. That's everybody on the planet moves. And we can create music there. It's just we're going to be the first. So remember, this is fun, Paul, so keep smiling. All right, all right, so here we go. Let's hope this all works, the audio. So just walk and try to stay within the beat. <laughs> can you hear it? Try it. Anybody, you can move the aisles, or you can just try to move your feet, but feel what that feels like, and then the difference when the music kicks in. We can dance if you want to. <laughs> yeah, you can exactly. <laughs> <laughs> this is 45 beats per minute. All right, everybody get a hand to our volunteer, Paul, and uh, to Cassie and Stephen and team, because again, these type recordings don't exist until now. We created it in 2015, and this is the first recording that you can hear slow, but it's got a very forward, can you hear that very forward, sustained, like you're being pulled forward sound? And you heard building in those harmonic textures, the building to lift and go upward, because if you just did it to a metronome or with no sensory input, your legs feel heavy, you feel heavy, you feel slow, there's not a sense of progress. So the music is composed to kind of feel like you're being pulled forward, upward, and still that consistent rhythm. So there was a lot of composition behind that. And now we're going down to four and yeah. 20, which is going to be two different states of Babies with cerebral palsy, like um, you didn't get to hear Jennifer describe it, but Lila was like a rag doll. She couldn't hold her head up. There was like a noodle. And then you have another extreme situation with folks where it's so much tone and rigidity, like the gentleman running with the wearable on his back, the metronome. He had a head injury, so his muscles, every time he tried to take a step, would just go rigid. 
and that's the gentleman Cassie and I've already started the compositions for in that extreme rigid tone. So two different movement needs where we've got to compose the music to get that for the rigid state that needs to bend, to extend, to go from like Paul looked much more in control, you both did. Once the music and you kept walking, you got more normalized. It all just kind of clicked in. Whereas a metronome is functional, but you look like a robot. <laughs> but it's better than nothing, right? And it's pretty incredible. We've seen a lot of really neat results, and one of the results um, remind me of his name, but he had cancer yes. um, and in his left leg, and he was uh, in San Antonio at the conference and was walking on the treadmill and, and could only walk two minutes mm -hmm. ever. That was all he could ever do. And um, as you could hear, a lot of the music is repetitive because it has to keep going. Um, it builds on top of each other, and you can, you can take in and out elements. And basically, he was able to walk six minutes. Six and he minutes didn't realize for the first it. time. At, at, yeah, which was incredible. Here's the fun part. He's one of the gods of physical therapy research and clinical, and he had cancer. And so we had the recordings, but also we have in that system the analytics that show the pretest, post-test, your progress, your norms. And Ed Behan, he said, he, they, they're close personal friends. They know each other well. And he said, you just finished six minutes. And he was stunned, one, because he couldn't do it. And he's a PT. And he looked at his analytics, and they were so much higher than what he'd been able to get to that point. So naturally, their program, he's about to be doing some of the research with this system and the recordings. Um, so we have a lot, we're going to be hearing a lot more stories now that this system is launched here in the United States, yeah. in Europe, and going into the Asian and then Australian markets. Yeah, and mm -hmm. as you can imagine, it's very fun to write for like 45 beats per minute, but we're working on, um, zero to four beats per minute, which is uh, like very, very difficult because um, most music is about like 70 beats per, misit, per minute. That's a um, fugue, I think yeah, it's that's, 70. I mean, yeah. that's the stuff that, you're, that you listen to. So, so writing for that, it seems like, oh, it's it just a slow piece. Um, but for writing for that sort of movement is, is awesome. It's, very, it's going to be difficult though, <laughs> but a lot of fun. And none of it could be achieved without merging technologies. Yeah. They license the use of the last two years. Um, we couldn't do this without their help. Um, a lot of this is proprietary information, so I can't go into the details. But also then Biodex, the medical systems. And now that this is launched, we have four other biomedical systems all wanting to get involved. And I got a call from Miami University. And their researchers were there. And they work with amputees. And the music, they said, we hate the metronome. Our amputees will not use the effective side the same. But with the music on the treadmill, everybody was wanting to use the side with the amputee as well as the other. So they're asking. They've got a big NIH grant. But merging technologies, biomedical companies, Biodex especially, um, some of the other shots, Rupert, Malcolm Harper, Real Sound Recording has been advising us and working with me for 20 years, um, knowing what we were trying to do even back then, but technology wasn't there. The music industry wasn't ready. Who am I forgetting, you guys? Our physical therapist, Rachel Thorpe, and the head researcher, um, Kristen Barda. We have a research study now with more advanced. We had a pilot study with stage one and two, people with Parkinson's that aren't maybe using a cane. Um, and that came out really powerfully. So we're going to where nobody does research on stages three and four. And we're doing at University of St. Augustine. They just got some new advanced equipment where it's a robotic um, harness on a track, and then a xenomat you walk over, and these are for people who are using wheelchairs and walkers only, who usually don't get to do the research and these things. So that's already started. We're um, doing that project actually now with these recordings. And then as soon as we have the slow recordings, we'll be doing the babies with cerebral palsy that should be walking, but they're not, and walking the, watching the difference. And that's a hard group, um, but they'll be also in that gate, the harness suspense. But we have to develop those recordings <laughs> first at those slower beats um, as the physical therapist moves their body and then the music compared to the kids who don't have that. So we've got some exciting stuff going on. No, it sounds very exciting. Um, so thank you, Hope. So we have time for a few questions. Feel, feel free. Go ahead, sir. I need it. I need it. Um, can you guys turn that mic on? There we go. There you are. Yep. So uh, you 
said that this music is personalized, and I can see the, the gate uh, or the metronomic feature, but how else do you personalize it? So we do something called PSC, and that's the pattern that the brain will need. So a knee lift, a knee bend up. You saw the trombone. We use the trombone heavily on a bend up versus a kick forward. So we match the functional movement with the correct instrumentation that can do that sensory that matches a kick, a lift, or a push or pull sound. So we did use a lot of wind instruments uh, intentionally for that, and also because of the DSD recordings report said you got to do wind, which really was a challenge on the musicians at 45 beats per minute. So this was just an example of that was a segment taken out of one of the pieces that we did for kids with cerebral palsy, um, sort of a focus area. And so, um, so yeah, basically every, that's just one segment that each, um, as you could hear the trombone, sort of the percussion elements um, related to, yeah, knee lifts, arm swings. Um, twisting, hips, yeah, turning, hips, like twisting, a, yeah. pulling the force, mm -hmm. like the force to the, the way you would have to um, heel strike is always the downbeat. So on a, on a very practical level, what happens is there's an interface that is controlled. But this is where we have to not go into too much detail, the but secret sauce. It can be changed yeah. by the PT, by the person who is running it. So what the PT prescribes for your body will be different to what is prescribed for the next person. For Paul versus you, and we would have will, a different fitting. And that would be controlled. First, uh, diagnose me Correct. Yeah. Movement deficiencies you're having, have, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the music would be fitted, fitted personalized. Yes. Yeah. Yep. And, 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 and that's in a part. way that would keep progressing. Correct. To move me beyond what Correct. I'm so that's the important part of our partnerships with the biomedical that are doing those advanced analytics. It's called biomechanical mechanisms. They know all the normal normal things that should be happening for you, for your height, for your age, for weight. And we're using those in high performance in athletes, but we're also using them in treatment. So that's why they're such an essential partner that our music links to those technologies. So, is this, so it extends from what I can do right now to where we want you to go? What a person with good mobility at my level or whatever mm -hmm. age, et cetera, would be able to do, and you would be kind of mm -hmm. taking that person onward. Right. So, really, our market, just you know, on the business plan, the fastest one and, and the, where they want it the most is the high performance athletics. But we're not going to leave out the kids and the people in the parks. That's just a commitment we've made that we're developing these and a technology for health. Whereas we know the performance market will move faster and get it. Yes. So all of them work for everybody. We're just not leaving out the folks who are usually left out. Well, we have a lot of people talking to us and um, I've funded it. Um, I've Put in, I, the Center for Music Therapy is 26 years old, it's for profit, so we have capital to reinvest, and we've been shifting our revenue modeling and switching, talking more and more to a service, teleservice, other things we're working on. So I've invested the most. Um, we've had partners, Biodex hasn't necessarily given us any money, but they've been developing that system, and they want future merging. It's $200,000 to do a year, what we've done. They haven't charged us. They've allowed us, and they work with their engineers and ours. So it's kind of those partnership agreements, um, and we'll be developing, and we have more people coming, knocking on our door. I think the expensive thing is the algorithm next, and that's, that's where we're having many people come in and talk um, to really take that to another level. I don't have my own personal funding to do that one. Well, you have the recordings that we develop commercially available now in Biodexes, and it's the only company we've licensed them to at this point. Now, we have other companies that came up to me in February that want to license it in their systems. But the iterations need to improve, because like I said, we haven't gotten a wearable yet that's doing this. And again, we have the algorithm and concept, and we've done all the first steps is we had to change the way the music was designed and recorded for the algorithm to ever even be developed. And then, of course, you have to train it. You have to, it's a learning algorithm. So those had to happen first. So then we're there, and we've got recordings and interface and other things ready now for an algorithm. That, that would be the piece to all the wearables and all those integrated technologies. So, so great, great answers to 
helpful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Joy, do you, do you want you to? Sorry, I have to let Joy ask a question because she's my wife. <laughs> 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 and we're going on a date tonight, okay? Yeah, so. this is <laughs> Two questions, I promise, um, and I think that probably more composing kind of questions. One okay. of my curiosities is, as you're composing this music, how much are you thinking about music that is fun to listen to beyond just physically matching the person? Because um, that was kind of, it sounded interesting, the music that you were playing. So I'm wondering how much is it that versus you really just have to pay attention to different instruments have to be played at certain times. Um, my second question, I can guess at the answer to this, but I don't know. So I'll ask it is, if you've composed something at 45 beats per minute and somebody needs it at 35 beats per minute, why can't you just slow it down? So great questions. So really I'll answer the last one real, real quick. Um, so if you, we, we can slow it down, um, but we have recorded at a bunch of different tempos so that sort of sliding into each of those tempos at whatever fits um, the patient uh, isn't sort of you know compressing it and creating uh, distortion. distortion. The sound um, is creating sort of you know all of that that stuff that that goes along when you speed something up and you know and it gets it gets higher in tempo. Or you slow it down and it gets lower. You know, so if we record it, then that all stays the same. Um, and then we, it's we set up those tempo ranges in the yeah. studio. If yeah, you go to yeah. movementtracksproject.com on our website you can follow the progress of these recordings all the way from New York, and you'll hear part of the discussion with Stephen figuring out at each temp range how far that file could stretch yeah. without the, the compression issues causing distortion. So in the Biotech system, they have it all the way down to 45, and their system can dial that down into the 30s and up to yeah. the 50s. Then the next range is recorded at 50, that that can take it up 10 to 12. Down. So each range has really good quality sound, but we worked all that out with Steven. If you watch those videos, you'll hear that discussion, us figuring out the range yeah. and making the musicians have to hold that trombone out in real time, right on pitch, and crescendo all the way through the end of the line. They were saying, this is harder than a marathon because we couldn't add a lot of effect because we have to dial it up and down. You yeah. can't use electronic effect for those to still have that good quality. A lot of engineering behind that. And Very then difficult. in regards to the first question about the music, um, so we sort of have these two test cases, one with children with cerebral palsy and then uh, for the first phase, um, and then uh, adults with Parkinson's. So going into it, I, I, I was like, you know, okay, children, like that was, that was the piece for children. And, um, I, you know, you want fun instruments, you want something that's more jazzy, you know, something that's going to be more big band, something that's going to be more fun to dance to. So, I mean, we had... We used, um, that's just a segment again, but there was uh, slide whistles, you know, there's hand claps, there's a, a bunch of really fun instruments that go along into that. Um, and that, that, you know, you just sort of think as a composer, like, okay, what would be fun to walk to for this specific patient, for this group of people that we're, that we're testing, that we're doing research with right now? And then eventually, for the future, we're going to want to um, open it up to a bunch of different genres, hip hop, classical, Latin, ja Latin everything, mm -hmm. just all of it, and collaborate with a bunch of different musicians all over the world on that, and get them to sort of, you know, understand the, the project and be able to write for all different genres, to have a, a bigger library of music. Um, because, can uh, be, oh, yeah. oh, because, um, you know, I can only write so much music for for different genres, but I'm not a I'm not a professional like in any means on all the different genres. So, um, so yeah, it's it's. And we have Stanley Jordan, uh, Danny Fender, Ray Benson, Ray all Benson, yeah. artists. As we work out our thesis and our methodology and get it more predictive analytics, because one of the things I want Cassie to say, she did almost give up, and she hasn't yeah. gone into her dark <laughs> night of the soul as a composer because everybody initially goes into oh it's going to be fun. But then that fun creates a functional problem. Cass, you want to tell me when you had this idea with the hi-hat and Lila, what happened to her body when you had this creative idea? As a composer, you thought it was great, and something happened. And this is where you have to make a default call always to the functional and the safety of the person, and realize they do have cerebral palsy, or they have MS, or they have Parkinson's. It's different. Yeah, there is definitely a lot of different type of music that I wrote, and I wrote one piece that we tested out with a live ensemble. 
Um, and uh, basically the, this, this hi-hat rhythm that I created um, had caused Lila's arm to, to, lose control. to lose control and flail, flail around, and that was something I was like, okay, we're probably gonna take that out or let's, let's figure out something else that we can do. And so that's, there was a lot of testing and a lot of it's very simple. It's very simple music, it's very, you know, um, but in regards to medical music. And so um, you can't really have complicated patterns, but with different patients you can have complicated stuff. So it's very, it's very different. Um, and all, yeah, and it, yeah, in regards to giving up, it was <laughs> that we, we dealt with a lot of um, musicians too when we recorded in New York who also uh, were not willing to record at very slow tempos, at, you know, record stuff, hold out wind instruments, you know, very long. Um, 